what makes a good story? <laughs> um, that, I feel like that is the lifelong question of most writers and, and theatre makers because we can study what makes a good story um, and there are a few rules um, but ultimately you, you're trying to craft a story that connects to people's universal experience is in my opinion what makes a good story but so the some rules of storytelling and and of dramaturgy in general um, are that you should choose your protagonist or your set of protagonists um, and you should take them on a journey so your protagonists do not necessarily need to be a hero they do not need to be heroic uh, but they definitely should start in one place and end up in a completely different place in their journey and that's what makes the most satisfying films, the most satisfying plays, is when you have one protagonist or a group of people that start from a place and something happens that throws their life off kilt and then they go on a journey to discover how to deal with it and then by the end they've discovered something new about themselves, they've overcome some challenges and they've either succeeded or failed in solving their problem but at least they have gone on a journey. So I think that being Specific is always when I'm working with writers and developing new scripts. That is always kind of what I advise is to be incredibly specific about the characteristics of your hero, of your lead character. Then deciding what obstacles you can put in the way of these characters that will make them have to fight against it. Because if you just have somebody that really wants to be rich and you give them, congratulations, you've won the lottery, that's the end of the story. <laughs> there's, there's nothing else for them to achieve. So you need to give them a strong want and then you need to give them some obstacles in the way of getting that want so they can go, I tried this way, doesn't work. I'll try another way, doesn't work. I'll try another way. And then you just see them trying and failing or trying and succeeding a little bit and then trying some more. You sometimes introduce other characters that are going to either help them along their way or they're going to hinder them on their way or they're going to um, show them different skills about themselves that they didn't know they had in which they can help them become their better selves in order to more easily achieve their objective. Um, and you just continue plotting a journey in which you see your hero either show the best of themselves or show the worst of themselves and usually both, <laughs> which makes for a very compelling character because it's a more well-rounded character. You try and make all the characters that interact with your hero as fully fledged as they can possibly be so that you are, as an audience, you are also relating to other characters. And then you get to the tricky part, which is giving them a satisfying resolution, whether, whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, some form of resolution that leaves them in a place in which the audience feel, okay, I have gone on a journey with this person and I've arrived at a different place. You may not know what it is. It may not be completely satisfying. It may not be the ending that you wanted, but at least it's a different place to where we started. What makes an actor a good actor? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. Um, and it's acting like any other craft is a craft that needs to be practiced and thoroughly and should be a lifelong commitment. Um, so I, when I train actors, I always make them aware that it's not, it shouldn't be a quick thing, it shouldn't be a fame thing, it shouldn't be a superficial thing. The true craft of an actor requires an incredible amount of work, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. Um, I would separate the, the training of a good actor into two sections. The first one is the body and the second one is the mind. Um, it's incredibly important for an actor to tr be able to train their body. Not only to be physically fit, even though that is very important, um, because for a multitude of reasons, but because if you're in, impersonating somebody else's physicality, um, and certainly if you're doing stage, more than screen you need a physical stamina to be able to take your character on a journey of two hours on stage running around sometimes dancing sometimes doing fight scenes that is an unnatural level of stamina so you need to train your body in terms of 
being able to sustain high energy for a long period of time. But also you need to train your body to exist in a neutral place. The best actors are actors that can, that have a neutral physicality and that can understand how that neutral physicality can then be morphed into other people's physicality. Um, because in order for you to be able to, like Joaquin Phoenix or like the, the best physical actors that you can think of or like Johnny Depp or like Meryl Streep, in order to achieve that level of physical differentiation for each character, you first need to understand what makes the what we call the neutral actor. So the neutral actor is you being able to be in a body that it has complete neutrality, understanding what your tics as a human are, where you carry your weight, where you carry your energy, where you carry your tensions, being able to let go of all of that so that then you can put other people's traits and tension and physicality. But first you need to be able to clean, do a clean slate and then put the other things on top. So that is the body part of training of the actor. Then the mind part is of course about being able to understand human psyche. And the best actors are actors that do a combination of homework, <laughs> actual studying of a character, but also have the natural instinct and empathy for what that human is feeling and being able to tap into, I know what that is and I know how to incorporate it immediately. Um, and so there is obviously a lot of studying and different techniques and different processes that actors are taught in order to understand a character's background, where they come from, how they think, why they think that way, how they were brought up, their set of beliefs, all of those things that make a person who they are. So an actor needs to be able to understand all of those, embed all of those, and then understand how that background affects how they think and act now, and justify their actions, reactions, throughout the course of the story. So you want an actor that is able to incorporate that research, be understanding and empathetic to what that character goes through, and also be able to incorporate and that thought to a level in which they can create, generate new reactions and new thoughts away from the page. You want an actor to be able to read what's in the page and go, okay, this is what the writer has written. I'm going to take it a step up by connecting the thoughts. And that's what the audience enjoys seeing. The audience enjoys seeing all the levels of subtext that are behind the words that are written. Because the words that are written, anyone can speak them. But the audience enjoys seeing all of the thoughts that happen in the pauses and how the thoughts come to them and when the audience knows that they're saying one thing but actually they mean something else in entirely that is all of the work of the actor through understanding the background of this character through understanding what they've gone through to uncover this is when they're lying this is when they're playing this game but they're saying these words so yes I think that that's what makes a good actor Theatre has been present in the history of humanity and telling stories about our experiences as humans has always been what us humans have done to make sense of the world. And theatre is one of the oldest forms of storytelling. Um, since, since the beginning of time, humans have gathered around to tell stories with more or less drama and with more or less music and accessories and, and grandiose. Um, kind of performance and storytelling has have always been th things. So in that sense, theatre carries with it a lot of weight, a lot of um, a lot of honor and and also like an ancient energy of storytelling that as humans have really carried from from the beginning of time. I think that all forms of performance that we understand now have evolved naturally from, you know, those Greeks telling stories in an amphitheatre. Um, and so if anything from the Netflix content that we consume to Hollywood came all stemmed from that. Um, and also from our, our need to utilise the divine to make sense of 
of what we understand of the world, you know, because Greek Greek theatre at the very beginning of the day has always made use of gods and chorus and you always had the, these non-human characters that told humans what to do and how to do it and, and by visualising it on a stage, it gave humans the ability to make sense of a world in chaos, I guess. So, so yeah, so theatre has a very long, 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 long history and heritage of being. Obviously, we've now evolved to, to a place in which maybe less and less people seek theatre as entertainment. There, there was an age before television in which you went to the theatre for all of your entertainment and you know when we look back to the beginning of the West End or the beginning of Broadway that's what that really was the golden age of theatre and musical theatre um, so I think that the times are changing theatre is changing with it it's we're adapting um, but yes that's all I have to say about theatre <laughs> The beginnings of theatre have always served as kind of a mirror to societies and to humanities to see their problems represented, to see the archetypes of their families represented and the archetypes of their relationships represented on stage um, and as a way for humans to kind of deal through their traumas and through their problems and and to be entertained and to maybe be made laugh or be, maybe to be made to forget about their lives. Um, obviously nowadays you can achieve all of those things via screen, which means that theatre is arguably losing more and more viewers, it's losing more and more importance, you know, between you staying in bed watching Netflix and having to buy a ticket and go to the theatre, it requires a lot more effort. Um, so, it, so it is undeniably losing traction. However, I would say personally that there is something really magical about the community of theatre and about going to a building in which all of these people gathered around are having the same experience. No play is going to be the same two nights in a row. No theatre show is going to be the same two nights in a row. And the energy and the electricity that you get from seeing people perform live, having to think live, and, and the very best actors are actors that can be feeling those feelings night and night again for the first time. Um, I think that that is something quite magical, something that for humans to... Um, be sitting next to strangers and and sharing in that one thing that will never happen again it never happened before it is a one moment in life that you are witnessing that thing together and you are getting that energy from the actors and from each other and how your neighbor is going to react to what they see is going to impact how you react to what you see like that is a kind of communal experience that you don't get really in any other art form um, that, that the, the magic of it being live. Um, and I think, I do think that that is particularly important with a new generation that has grown up on screens, a new generation that perhaps has more difficulty communicating face to face and has, and, and because what they understand from human interactions is what they see here. Um, I, I think that the value of theatre is more important now than ever. And also the ability of theatre to make you imagine a, a, away from what you see in screen content. Like screen content, you are able to CGI anything you can dream of. But in theatre, you really need to utilise the power of your imagination. And for... And for a group of people to be told, this is a box, <laughs> and for a, another group of people to look at it and see a box, that is magic. And that power of imagination, I think, is incredibly important in the times we live in to inspire a new generation to really use their imagination. I think that theatre has a massive responsibility but also a big problem in, in nowadays which is that more and more people have shorter attention spans, more and more people want a wow factor above anything else and want to be dazzled, constantly dazzled. Um, 
And, and obviously theatre can do that. It can definitely give you the spectacle, but also a lot of the magic of theatre is the subtlety and, and you know, you seeing a play for three hours that just gets more and more intense and audiences increasingly are losing the ability to concentrate for three hours and to really engage for three hours. So I think that the responsibility for theatre at the moment is to take the best of what audiences are consuming via media, so the, the quickness and the sharpness of films and, and videos and that the quick cuts and trying to translate that as much as possible to stage, which I think is a very interesting challenge because it means that then as theatre makers we're having to push the boundaries of what we make and, and we know that we can't rely on like, oh, if we just tell the story well told, it'll be fine, people will like it. No, it needs to be a story well told, but it needs to be told for this generation. It needs to have a different kind of speed. It probably needs to have a different kind of inventiveness of what can you do on stage with humans that is unlike what you can see on a screen with CGI. Like, what is it that you can create? What is the experience and the emotion that you can create as an ensemble of people that live will give you a different experience to what you can consume on your screens. Um, and I think that more theatre makers are, are trying to merge media into stage and trying to make it either more interactive through, um, through immersive theatre and, and being able to transform theatre away from just the audience actors <laughs> and being able to give an experience that is more tactile, that utilises all of the senses in the way that you, again, you wouldn't be able to get with a screen. Um, but also it's making theatre makers having to play with other forms. Like for example, at the moment in the UK, gig theatre is a very big thing. Um, and gig theatre is stories that are told, often in musicals, stories that are told through the setting of a gig, like a music gig. So you've got You've got a band, you've got a drum kit and you've got some guitars and everyone on microphones and they're telling you a story and they're acting with that. So for example, that has that is an example of a way in which theatre makers have gone, okay, well, how can we take up this experience and make it interesting to a generation that is disconnecting more and more from the stage? British theatre has always been very iconic for its comedy or, or certainly the comedy that we know and appreciate now in the West has come from from a very British tradition for comedy which is which is slightly different from the European tradition um, Europeans European comedy like Lecoq school um, has tended to be a bit more physical than maybe British theatre has. Um, so, so since the times of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's realised that you could merge highly physical comedy with highly witty and verbose comedy and a level of silliness that the combination of these three factors would make for something very special. So I think that this is probably where British comedy as we know it today has evolved from because if we then step forward several hundreds of years and we get ourselves to the 70s and the 80s and the 90s in which the screen worldwide started to give us some of the great comic comic series and, and comic characters like Mr Bean or like Monty Python or like Little Britain um, really iconic ways of playing with a combination of physicality like with Mr Bean what you're seeing is again going back to the storytelling that we were talking earlier a character with many flaws who pursues his objectives full-heartedly he everything he goes for he goes full-heartedly who really embodies this stereotypical British man everything about his sounds and his physicality and the situations that he finds himself in are the full embodiment of Britain at the time and and a character that just goes goes for his objective regardless of how difficult the obstacles are and that's what the audience is laughing at the audience is laughing at this man trying and failing and trying and failing without ever giving up on pursuing his objectives whilst doing it with 
a highly, highly physical, very specific, precise body language. And specifically with Mr. Bean, his understanding of comic beats and, and letting every pause for reaction land so that there is always a moment of something happens, then he reacts to it and, and everyone else's reaction to it. Like, I, I think that he really was... Um, one of the great innovators of how we now perceive that comic timing to come. And very similar to what Charlie Chaplin started, but what Mr. Bean as a concept built on was also adding that kind of linguistic barrier, even though it is watched worldwide without people understanding English. They still understand that there is something about that sound that is incredibly British. And that's where Mr. Bean has, has really been an incredibly iconic figure worldwide. I think it's important to, when talking about British performance and, and British theatre and American performance and American theatre, it's, it's important to be aware of the social history of both and and that obviously Britain has a head start <laughs> it started much earlier and and theater has been a very theater and performance was always a very big part of um, the UK and, and Britain's entertainment industry um, the queens were entertained and Shakespeare wrote for the royals and and so there there's always been this profound commitment to characters and stories well told and since Queen Elizabethan time you've had you've had um, plays being written for the entertainment of the masses um, and that is something that then America took on and built from so if you if you bear in consideration that America has always been a melting pot of cultures the effect that that has had in entertainment has been huge and that's why you started going from music halls to big musicals. The, the, the tradition of, for example, musical theatre started in America because you, you were able to take already a very rich history of storytelling on stage, very good, and then enhance it by starting putting music on it. And the moment that they realised that profound combination of music and text that sparked it, then it just snowballed from there. And the value of entertainment, so your MGMs and the golden age of musical theater started booming in America a lot earlier than it did in the UK. And so when you're looking at these timelines simultaneously, it there was quite a lot of cross conversation. Then the UK realized that musical theater was starting to be big, so the UK started doing it as well. America started trying to take the tradition of serious theatre into their own and also started building the film industry a lot quicker than the UK did. So then you had like a big boom of screen and Hollywood and acting for screen, which is a completely different technique in terms of acting for screen and acting for stage that America developed a lot faster than the UK did. So. Looking at both of those, it's like there is always a little bit of a race in which one is ahead in discovering new techniques, the other one is going to take and is going to enhance it and discover new techniques, which is probably why your biggest entertainment that you have is between the UK and, and the States, because they are constantly in conversation with one another. Also because the language is the same, so that's incredibly helpful in terms of the cross-pollination of of uh, forms, but of actors and filmmakers and theatre makers, um, but in which it brings us to today, in which the, the acting style has evolved into something that audiences can see very clearly when a series is American or when a series is British. They, they have different tempos, they have different performance styles, they have different writing styles as well, like the, the voice of the writers are telling things perhaps in, sometimes in slower and more detailed terms in, in UK writing and in American writing it tends to perhaps be a bit snappier, a bit bigger, a bit broader, a bit more over the top 
sometimes. So, and, and it's interesting to just note how, how the different languages have evolved both in acting styles, in voices of filmmakers, in voices of theatre directors, um, and in terms of the overall material that you end up with. <laughs>